Hi, and welcome to West Bloomfield United Methodist Church. I'm Reverend Elizabeth Hurd. We had some technical difficulties on Sunday and we were unable to live stream our service. However, because we're in the middle of our sermon series, The Journey Begins, I felt that it was important that those who worship with us online at least could hear the scripture and the sermon from Sunday. We are continuing to explore what it means to be on a journey with God through the story of Moses and Jesus. Today, we are talking about the question of who am I? Who am I on this journey? Let us start with our scripture from Exodus. Our scripture from Exodus comes from Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. And some of you might hear this and feel like it's familiar. It's the calling of Moses from the burning bush. So Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. And then God said, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. God said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hissites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has come to me now. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to the Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God said, I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And God said further, thus you should say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, thus you shall say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations. Our second scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 21 through 28. And in this, we see Jesus continuing to teach his disciples about who he is and what it means for him to be the Messiah. So from that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block for me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their lives for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? 
for the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the word of God for the people of God, and we give thanks to God. So we're continuing this sermon series called The Journey Begins. And last week, we, we started the sermon series by talking about how when we go on a journey, we need to have the right tools. In an unpredictable and chaotic environment like a jungle, the right tools are a compass and a guide. And our world is unpredictable and chaotic sometimes. It can be like a jungle. And so in this world, Christians have our faith as our compass because our faith always points us to God, our true north, and we also have Jesus as our guide, Jesus who walked through this jungle-like world already and shows us how to do the same. But you know, going on a journey is not just about having the right tools. It's also about knowing yourself well. When you go on a journey, it is really good to know your own strengths, your own weaknesses, your health, your abilities, your limitations. It is good to know yourself. So back in September of 2021, I visited one of my friends from seminary out in Arizona. And of course, in Arizona, we had to go to the Grand Canyon. We ended up going to the North Rim of the Grand Canyon, where we had the chance to hike a little bit into the canyon. Now we only went about half a mile down and then back up because we were not prepared for a hike longer than that. We didn't have the right tools. We didn't have the right water bottle. We didn't have the right kind of food, right? We just were not prepared for a longer hike. And that's not even to mention that my hiking abilities were not up to par for a hike through the Grand Canyon. I have only ever hiked through woods in Michigan, and so I wasn't used to the change of altitude that comes with the Grand Canyon, or even the heat that comes with the Grand Canyon. But we could hike a little bit down and a little bit back to say, hey, we hiked in the Grand Canyon. Now, all along the route, there were these signs that pointed out to hikers how many people per year needed to be rescued from the Grand Canyon. And there were even signs saying that if you reach the ranger station on Bright Angel Trail, they would check your fitness and your preparation before they let you go on the rest of the hike. So if you weren't prepared enough to go on, you wouldn't be able to go. The basic message of all of the signs was this. Don't push yourself. Don't push yourself too hard. Know your limits. Know when you need to stop and know what you are able to do and know what you aren't able to do. Check in with yourself before you go on this journey. So this is what this week is about. Confronting ourselves and our limitations as we go on this spiritual journey with God and with each other. Now I should say, it is a very good thing of our faith that we never have to prove to God that we are fit enough to continue on this spiritual journey. We don't have check-in points where God says, yes, you're good to continue. No, you have to stop here. We don't have to prove to God that we can handle the rest of our spiritual journey. But that doesn't mean we don't have a responsibility to confront our own limitations. We need to know where we need to be lifted up and helped along. We need to know what our stumbling blocks may be. We also need to know when we should ask for help on this journey. So the question of who am I then, it doesn't pertain to God. In fact, when asked, who are you? God answers pretty definitively, right? Because when Moses asks, what, who should I call you? What should I say your name is? God says, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and Jacob. I am who I am. That is my name for all generations. And we know the answer to who Jesus is because Peter answered that for us in our scripture from last week, right? Jesus is the Messiah. We know this. So this question of who am I, it does not pertain to God. It pertains to us. We need to be asking ourselves, who am I? What do I carry with me? What are my strengths? What are my limitations? What can I leave behind? Who am I as I go on this journey? Our scriptures for today highlight this question in two very different ways. 
So our scripture from Exodus highlights those moments when we see God, when we meet God, and we recognize our own limitations, and we feel inadequate when God has called us to do something. In those moments when we feel inadequate and recognize our limitations, we see that God calls us toward capability. But our scripture from Matthew highlights those moments when we are unaware of our limitations, when we haven't taken proper stock of our limitations, and when God has to remind us to humbly follow. So we have, one, recognizing our limitations, feeling inadequate, and having God call us toward capability. And two, not recognizing our limitations, feeling overconfident, and having God call us toward humility. So we'll start with the scripture from Exodus. This is Moses' call from God. This is probably one of the most cinematic scenes in the Exodus story. We see Moses tending to his father-in-law's sheep. He encounters a bush that is on fire and yet is not being consumed by the fire. It's not burning. And, and, and from that bush comes the voice of God saying, Moses, Moses. After a brief conversation of figuring out just exactly what is happening, we see God tell Moses, I have heard the misery of my people in Egypt, and I am sending you to confront Pharaoh and free my people. And Moses basically goes, um, excuse me? What? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? You see, at this point in his life, Moses was settled in the land of Midian. He had fled Egypt presumably years ago because he had killed an Egyptian overseer who had been harming a Hebrew man. Now Moses thought he had done this in secret. He thought he had gotten away with it. But then two other Hebrew men confront him about it and say, aren't you the one that killed that Egyptian? And then word begins to spread until eventually Pharaoh finds out and Pharaoh orders that Moses be killed. Now, Moses couldn't go and hide among the Hebrew people. He couldn't go hide among his own people because they had already rejected him. And he certainly couldn't go and find a hideout among the Egyptians. He was afraid that they would turn him over to Pharaoh. And so he made the only choice he felt like he could, and he fled Egypt. He goes to the land of Midian. And there he meets Zipporah, one of the many daughters of the chief priest Jethro. And he marries Zipporah. He has children. He has a job as his father-in-law's shepherd. He's left Egypt behind, and he has settled into life in a new land. So truly, truly, who is he, who is Moses, to go back to Egypt and lead the people? Egypt had rejected him. His own people had rejected him. So why would God ask him to do this? Now, God assures Moses that he will not be alone in this effort. God will be with him. And in fact, he assures Moses that this is not even Moses' effort. This is God. God is the one who's acting. God is the one who's liberating. God is the one who will deliver the people into freedom. Moses is God's prophet, the one through whom God will speak and free the people. Moses' human limitations should not matter since everything that's about to happen is God's doing. Yet Moses still resists. Even when God assures Moses that God will be with him, Moses continues to resist. He continues to worry about his limitations. The confrontation between God and Moses goes on into chapter 4 of Exodus. And in chapter 4 of Exodus, we, we see Moses continue to worry. What if they don't believe me, he asks. God answers by turning Moses' staff into a snake, and then making his hand leprous and then clean again, and then assuring him that there will be many more signs to prove that it is God. But Moses resists still. I'm not eloquent. I stutter. Please send someone else. And God replies, who gives people their voices? Who gives sight and hearing? But Moses still resists. And we see God get annoyed and a little angry. But God finally relents by saying, okay, fine. Your brother Aaron will be with you. So many of us know the rest of the story. And although this will be a spoiler for later weeks, we know that Moses goes back to Egypt. And after resistance from Pharaoh and great signs of power from God, the Israelites are delivered from captivity. Moses, who didn't want to go, who was coming up with every excuse in the book not to do what God was asking him to do, goes. And God frees the people, and then Moses leads them. And Moses becomes the most important leader in Israelite history. It's Moses who leads the people through the wilderness for 40 years. It's Moses who receives the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. 
It's Moses who keeps the nation together as they wander toward the promised land. Moses, who was so worried about his limitations. Moses, who wondered, who am I to do this? Moses, who felt like he was inadequate. And yet, we see that, that God keeps promising Moses he is good enough. I will be with you, God says. You are not alone. You are not on your own. I'm the one who is offering signs. I will give you the words. And then even when Moses continues to resist, God meets that resistance with the promise of help. You feel like you're not a good enough speaker? Fine. Aaron will be with you. You can work with him to free my people. We see that whenever Moses doubted his ability to go to Egypt and deliver the message that God was asking him to, God answered his doubt with promise. So there will be times in our own lives where we're like Moses, right? There will be times when we doubt we are good enough to do what God is calling us to do. We'll worry about our own human limitations and wonder if truly God has called the right person. I know there are plenty of times in my life where I've wondered that where I wondered if I was cut out for the work ahead. It happens a lot in the life of church and in the life of ministry. Sometimes God calls us out of our depth, but when that happens and when God calls us to go further and further than we think is possible, and we ask, who am I to do this? We have to remember that God is with us. And in fact, the work we're doing, it's not our work, it's God's work. And, and if God is calling us to do the work, then we are the right people for the job. And yes, sometimes other people will have to be brought into the work with us like Aaron was brought to help Moses. But guess what? The truth is, when, when, when God calls us, God's already taken our limitations into account. God knows our limitations. God knows our strengths. God knows us better than anyone. And so when God calls us, we are good enough. We can be assured that we are good enough. And in those moments when we doubt we're good enough, God continues to call us. God continues to call us toward capability. But just as there are times where we will recognize our own limitations and doubt our fitness to do what God is calling us to do, there will be times when we don't recognize our human limitations and we are way too overconfident in our thinking. And in those moments, who am I is not a question of doubt, but a necessary question of reflection. There have to be times when we ask, who am I? And get the answer, oh, right, I'm a human and I do not know the ways of God and I cannot know the ways of God. And this is where our gospel reading comes in for today. Because we have this story from Matthew where Jesus is continuing to teach the disciples about who he is. Now this comes after the conversation about how Jesus is the Messiah. We read that conversation in worship last week. There's this conversation about how Jesus is the Messiah. And so he's telling the disciples, he's telling his followers exactly what it means for him to be the Messiah. He says he'll have to go to Jerusalem and that in Jerusalem he will suffer and be put to death, but he will raise again on the third day. Jesus is preparing his disciples for what will happen to him. Jerusalem, suffering, death, resurrection. Jerusalem, suffering, death, resurrection. Jesus is preparing the disciples for how his ministry and time on earth will end. And Peter's not having any of it. He takes Jesus aside and admonishes him, rebukes him. He says, God forbid it, this should not happen to you. And God, uh, Jesus harshly replies, get behind me, Satan. Whew. Get behind me, Satan. You have the things of man in mind, not the things of God. Poor Peter. Peter had just gotten it right. Literally moments before this, he had named Jesus as the Messiah and Jesus had praised him for it. Peter had just earned his gold star as a student of Jesus. He had just had the things of God in mind. And now, what, ma? Peter gets it wrong. And Peter's getting it wrong for the exact reason Jesus is saying he's getting it wrong. Peter has the things of man in mind. Peter is right in naming Jesus as the Messiah, but it's evident in this exchange that Peter has a very human conception of what the Messiah is and what the Messiah will do. Peter and many others who were following Jesus probably would have expected that the Messiah would triumph over Rome. 
As N.T. Wright puts it in his study on Acts, quote, Jesus' motley band of followers had imagined he would be some king in some quite ordinary sense. Unquote. They believed that the Messiah would be an earthly ruler, that he would rule over Israel as the top nation in the world and be a king seated on an earthly throne, that he would overthrow Rome and restore Israel to its rightful earthly power. This is likely the idea that Peter had of the Messiah. Now, not to bash Peter too much, it is a very valid idea. This conception of the Messiah is one that came from interpretation of Scripture. It came from interpretation of Scripture, meeting the experiences of the people and the expectations of the people. The people of Israel, they, they had hoped that their suffering would end when a Messiah came and restored the nation of Israel to glory. And this expectation of a conquering, strong, and powerful Messiah was perfectly valid. It was perfectly valid. So to hear that the Messiah, the triumphant one sent by God, would suffer? That's unthinkable. And being killed? That's unimaginable. Why would Jesus be saying such things? He's the Messiah, and this is not what the Messiah is supposed to be. So Peter pulls him aside and rebukes him, probably because Peter doesn't want to believe what Jesus is saying, but also because what Jesus is saying might lose him followers. This isn't what the people want to hear. I mean, who wants to follow a teacher who is going to die? And so we see Jesus put Peter back into his place by saying, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block for me. That is harsh. But what Jesus is saying here is right. Peter is so intent and so focused on what he thinks is the right way for Jesus to be the Messiah that he is closed off to God's way. Peter is thinking in the way of man. God's way is very different than the way of man. The way of man is conquering and powerful. God's way is a little more loving, a little more peaceful, and a lot more life-giving than what Peter has in mind. Here, Peter is not recognizing his own human limitation. He dares to admonish the one he just named as Messiah because Jesus is saying something antithetical to what Peter believes to be true. Peter believes the Messiah will be the conquering hero. Jesus is saying that's not the case. He's telling Peter, your conception of who I am is not right. Your idea is limited by your humanity, so get behind me and get the things of man out of your mind. In other words, let go of what you think you know and follow Jesus. Recognize the limitations that your humanity places on you and put your full trust in our all-knowing divine God. Let go of the things of man and embrace the things of God or get out of the way. So what does this mean for us? Well, it means when we ask the question, who am I while on this journey with God? We have to recognize that we are human. We do not fully know God's ways. As, as the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13, 9, for we know only in part and we prophesy only in part. And then later in verse 12, he says, for now we see in a mirror dimly. When it comes to the ways of God, our humanity limits us. Just like we talked about it, um, two weeks ago in our sermon on fearing God. We have to be humble enough to realize that we are not God. And there may be things that we think we know, but we truly do not know in full. This is so important to realize on a journey of faith that we do not know in full. You know, it's often said that the most dangerous person on a hike is not the inexperienced hiker because the inexperienced hiker will follow the guide. They will look to the guide for direction. They will listen to what the guide is saying. The most dangerous person on a trail is the experienced hiker who thinks they know better than the guide because they are less likely to follow directions and more likely to get hurt or lead others astray. They're the ones who need to be airlifted out of the Grand Canyon because their overconfidence got them into a situation they truly were not prepared for. On our journey with God, we need to remember that we are always in the position of the inexperienced hiker. There is always something we don't know. There is always something more about God we can learn. No matter how long we've been on this journey, whether we are taking our first step or our 10 millionth step, we need to remember that when it comes to God, we are the inexperienced ones. 
and we have to be humble enough to recognize that we should be following God in all things. So who are we on this journey? We're humans. We are humans doing our best to follow God. Now, Sometimes on this journey, God is going to call us towards something we are unsure we're capable of. And like Moses at the burning bush, we might doubt that we are the right person for the job and we might ask, who am I that you are asking me to do this, God? And when those moments happen, the thing we need to let go of is our doubts and our worries. And we need to trust that God will equip us to do the work to which we are being called. If God is calling us, we are capable. And then sometimes on this journey, we're going to think we know better than God and we won't recognize our own limitations. And then God is gonna to have to call us toward humility. We'll have to ask the question, who am I? And realize the answer is, I'm not God. And like Peter, we will have to be put back into place by God. And we have to be humble enough to follow God, even if God's way is very different than what we think, what we were taught, or what we expect. As we walk on this journey with God, we will constantly be balancing these two ways of thinking. There will be those times we recognize our limitations and are unsure that God is calling the right person. But we have to be open to God's call and remember that God is with us. We are on this journey for a reason because God has called us on this journey and God would not be calling us towards something we are incapable of doing. And then of course there will be the times where we think we know better than God and we'll have to remember our limitations. That we are human and God is God and we just have to follow where God leads. So who am I? Who are we? We're humans. We are humans walking on this journey with God. And the good news that we can find in both of these stories is that when we follow God's call, whether that's a call toward capability or a call toward humility, we are better equipped to continue on this journey and go further and further. Amen and thanks be to God.